Trabzon is the ancient city of Trebizond, which had its golden age towards the end of the Byzantine era as the capital of the Komnenian Empire. Today there's very little to see of its glorious past. It's mainly a very modern bustling port dealing mainly with Russia. Its main square has the obligatory statue of Ataturk. We took the trip to see the Sumela Monastery, clinging to a cliff 1200 meters above sea level. The last few hundred meters we had to walk. The entrance to the monastery is up a steep flight of stone stairs. The original rock church is on the bottom left. The other buildings date from various periods, including as late as the 19th century. The outer wall of the rock church is covered in frescoes. This one shows the Komnenian Emperor Alexios III. And this one shows our old friend St. George. And here are the Stations of the Cross. Inside the cavern is covered in frescoes dating from three distinct different periods beginning with the 9th century AD. The other periods are roughly the 13th century and the 18th century. In some places, later frescoes have been painted over the earlier ones. Opposite the rock church is a smaller chapel. This is also adorned with many frescoes inside. All the frescoes at Sumela Monastery have been subject to damage over the centuries and many of them have been chipped away and stolen. The monastery was finally abandoned by its monks in 1923 with the forced transfer of population at the end of the Turkish-Greek War. And now it's time for us to head back to Discovery to sail to our next port, Sochi. This part of the eastern coast of the Black Sea only became part of Russia in the early 19th century. And Sochi began to be developed as a resort at the start of the 20th century. There are pleasant promenades and boulevards and some nice early 20th century hotels and other civic buildings. But these are under threat now from modern developers, the oligarchs. Just a few kilometres from the city centre is Mount Akun with its observation tower. From this vantage point, almost 700 metres above sea level, you can get a good view of the whole of Sochi laid out along the coast of the Black Sea. And inland, the Caucasus Mountains. Sochi's real importance began in the 1930s when Stalin built his dacha here. This is a very large complex of buildings and Stalin could run the entire Soviet government from here.
Stalin was very short, so his furniture was scaled down to make him look more imposing. The rule was, nobody beat the boss on this billiard table. Drinks and nibbles served in Stalin's rather imposing dining room. One of Sochi's oldest spas is the Matsesta, built right at the beginning of the 20th century. This place has seen better times. The Arboretum Park was founded by a wealthy Russian businessman towards the end of the 19th century. The War Memorial by the entrance to Riviera Park. This park was also founded by a wealthy businessman towards the end of the 19th century and this statue is to a local boy who became a cosmonaut. All the cosmonauts left memorials in this park. Discovery was overnight in Sochi, which meant we had the pleasures of the folkloric show. Yalta on the Crimean Peninsula, since the 1950s part of Ukraine, although the majority of the population are ethnically Russian. During the late Tsarist period, Yalta was developed as a fashionable resort and in Soviet times it became a resort as well, at this time for the workers of course. Large numbers of Discovery's crew headed straight for the McDonald's. You wonder what old Lenin there thought of it all. In better weather Yalta's long seaside promenade would be quite a pleasant walk. Signs of decay in some of Yalta's old buildings. But Alexander Nevsky Church is looking well looked after. We took a half day tour from the ship. First stop, Massandra Palace. This place was actually very little more than a hunting lodge where the Tsar and his guests stopped for a few hours refreshment during a busy day out hunting. Livadia Palace was the site of the 1944 Yalta Conference. This is the actual conference room. Because it's now used for business meetings, the actual conference table has been moved outside. Them 
We were treated to tea in a courtyard at Navadia Palace with a gymnastic entertainment and also the inevitable folkloric show. Sevastopol, and although we're still in Ukraine, the warships here are the Russian Black Sea Fleet. The status of Sevastopol being effectively a Russian city and naval base within Ukraine continues to be a source of friction between the two countries. The classical port gate, dating from 1846, leads directly to the city centre and Nakhimov Square, named after Admiral Nakhimov, whose statue dominates the square, and he led the defences of Sevastopol during the Crimean War. Sevastopol is a city of hundreds of monuments. This one is to the scuttled ships, an event during the Crimean War. The modern monument in the background commemorates Sevastopol as a hero city of the Great Patriotic War, as they call the Second World War here. This memorial is to the Soviet Black Sea Fleet of the Second World War. This memorial is to the siege of Sevastopol during the Second World War by the Germans. This is Catherine the Great. This celebrates the courage of the young communists. Approaching Odessa. And here's Captain Derek Kemp driving us in. Once again, a Russian band to welcome us in. A modern cruise terminal has been built on top of the old pier. With an inexplicable modern sculpture. And there are the Potemkin Steps. Dating from about 1840, there are 192 steps. From the bottom, you can see only steps. From the top, you can see only landings. At the top of the steps is the Duc de Richelieu. This French nobleman was the first Russian governor of Odessa and set about designing the new city in a very French style. His successor, Prince Vorontsov built this palace nearby, together with this rather interesting Doric folly. Primorsky Boulevard links Vorontsov Palace with the Richelieu Monument and at the other end the City Hall, where there was a demonstration going on for part of the time we were there. 
Pushkin lived in Odessa for a while and his statues in front of the city hall, along with this signpost pointing to other interesting places. The Opera House was built in the 1880s. Odessa now has a flourishing Mediterranean-style café society. Catherine the Great looks down on the city she founded. There's lots of regeneration work going on in the historical city centre. And behind some of those old facades are modern shopping malls. Our next port of call was Constanza in Romania, but we only had time for a short visit to the Greco-Roman ruins of Istria. Originally founded in the 7th century BC, Istria was destroyed and rebuilt several times. The Romans took over in the 1st century AD and the city was eventually abandoned, largely because of silting caused its access to the Black Sea to be lost. There's a small archaeological museum on the site showing such things as Roman water pipes. Nesabar in Bulgaria is an ancient city built on a rocky promontory into the Black Sea, connected by a causeway to the mainland where there are now modern seaside resorts. It's a World Heritage Site, famous mainly for its many churches built over the centuries. Our first stop is the 14th century St. John Alitogatos overlooking the sea. Next stop, St. Stephen's, with its collection of icons. Originally dating from the 11th century, most of the church, including the icons, date from the 16th to the 18th centuries. Church of Christ Pantocrator. Next stop, St. John the Baptist. St. Paraskeva still has some of its original green ceramic decoration in place. St. Michael and Gabriel, Church of the Archangels. And this is what remains of the old Cathedral of Nesabar. The Church of St. Theodore, or Todo as he's known here. And this is St. Spaz. This was the Turkish Baths. What remains of the Basilica by the seashore?
There are several cafes and restaurants with good views over the Black Sea, with an extra object in sight today. And we had a very nice lunch in one of those restaurants. The waiter assured us everything was top nosh and lovely jubbly. We walked back via the old Greek ramparts near the beginning of the causeway to the mainland and back through the little harbour to tender back to the ship for the last time before we go back to Istanbul and the end of the cruise.